What was going on at the pool where Jesus healed the man? That's what we're going to talk about today in John 5. Woohoo! Now we're at John 5, and it says there was a feast of the Jews. It doesn't really say which feast it was. We know that there were many feasts inside the Jewish faith, and this one was just one, where Jesus was in Jerusalem. It says he was by the Sheep Gate and near a pool in Aramaic that was called Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. This was the place people went for healing. People believed that this water would bubble up, that it would be the angels churning up the water and causing the healing for people. There was a man named Conrad Schnick who discovered this pool in the 19th century. It is northwest of what is St. Anne's Church in the old city of Jerusalem. And people now, with more archaeological investigation, are pretty confident this is the pool that was described in John. Of course, because the Romans love their healing pool, they built temples around it, and there were Byzantine, it says, and Crusader churches. Hadrian's temple had Asclepius, which was a Greek god of healing, of course, they had to do that. And the one thing you learn about the Romans when you go to England or you go to Israel is they loved their healing pools. And it said there were many people, some were blind and lame and paralyzed, and one man had been for 38 years impaired. And so Jesus saw him there and asked him, do you want to be healed? And this poor man had tried to get to the water when the angels were stirring it up, and he never could get there because he, his legs didn't work or he just wasn't capable. The man's like, you know, can you help me get down there so that I can get this water? And Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. And instantly the man was healed. Again, of course, this is the Sabbath. And so people were mad about it, that it's not lawful to pick up your bed on Sabbath. It's not permitted. And the guy's like, you know, the guy who healed me told me to take up my bed and walk away. I thought it was interesting because who does that, I don't know, harm when you tell someone they can't carry their bed? It is people who carry their bed, which tends to be poor people. Oh, the beds that the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and everyone had, those were in houses. They were in their own house. They went to bed in their own beds. But a poor man is someone who would pick up his bed and walk. It's a very cruel thing to say, well, just leave your bed there. And hopefully it's still there when you get back or just stay there. Don't even leave. It's it's just a huge act of cruelty. In this case, it was another interesting story, too, because. This man didn't show extreme measures of faith like other people had. He didn't really even know who he was. He just knows that Jesus told him to sin no more so that nothing worse may happen to you. Of course, the the temple structure was going to be mad at Jesus for doing this because he did it on a Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, and I love this answer. My father is working until now. I'm working it's important to know that God doesn't rest on us. Would you not want your prayers answered on a Sunday or a Saturday, a Friday night during Sabbath? Of course not. You would hope that God would answer your prayers on whatever day you have come to God and asked him for mercy for something. It's kind of making me think, why are people in the time of Jesus so against him healing people on Sabbath. And I decided it was a personal problem. They did not want someone coming to them and asking for healing or for prayers or for something like that, cleansing, because it's their day off too. If I have to go pray for people or go and, you know, heal people, then, you know, now I'm working on Sabbath. It's like I get a day off just like the person who grinds grain gets off. But, you know, I think we come to that idea That even on our Sabbath, whether we're Christian or Jewish, if we work at a hospital, we work. We pick a different day for Sabbath. We understand the importance of people over the Sabbath. And Jesus talks a lot about that. We've talked about it in past episodes about the Sabbath. But Jesus was like, you know, my father works. And that's such a great answer to them all. At that point, then I assume in the temple structure, wanted to kill him even more because he just said, my father, 
my father's still working. I'm working. He just tried to make himself equal with God the Father. Boy, that made him even more mad than the Sabbath thing. So then Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. He is still talking about God the Father, talking about him as the Son, talking about how he works, how he acts, how he raises the dead and he gives life and he does everything. The father, it, he says, has, judges no one. The son has all the judgment and that everyone should honor the son just like they honor the father. Boy, I bet you that made them really mad. And those who don't honor the son are not honoring the father either. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Really, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Wow. I mean, this is deep stuff. If you read the commentaries on it, there's a lot of discussion about what all of this means because it is pretty deep material. But I think the idea here is he is tying himself to the Father because Jewish people believe in God the Father, the one who rumbled the mountain, who met Moses on Sinai, who they believe created the world, but the one who also gave them the covenants. They look back at time and don't see God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. I think when we get to the Old Testament, we will. But it's easier for us in a sense because we know the end of the story. We know where to look for these things. They're going along step by step, listening to the word of God, of the law and the prophets, and trying to parse it out. I think they were wrong in how they went about doing it. Now, when we look back, we see the spirit of the Lord right there at the beginning of Genesis, and we see the Son at Genesis. We see Jesus in the fire of Daniel. You know, I think we will start to see him because we understand now that whole Trinity split when I don't think people saw it before. So he ties himself to the Father because that is the part that they understand. You see your Father, you love the Father who gave you this land, who was the Father of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all of them. That's me. I'm the Son. I am with him from the beginning. And people who believe in me, they will have the life to come and will be no longer dead. He warns people, too, that there will be people coming. He says that an hour is coming when the people in their tombs will hear his voice and come out. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil will get the resurrection of judgment. This becomes hard to hear because we are so far away from it that it feels like people were separated from that. And what he is saying is, this is obvious. This is obviously where it was going. This was always the case. This was the case from the very beginning. You might not have believed it. You might not understood it, but it was the case. Believe in the Son like you believe in the Father. He says how he does nothing on his own, that every bit of judgment he does has to do with who sent him, which is going to be God the Father but also mentions that John the Baptist was bearing testimony to him, saying he was coming, preparing the way, crying in the desert, shining a light so that you could see more light. You could rejoice in this light. This testimony of John was all pointing to me. Again, I think John was the last of the Old Testament prophets who was doing the prophecy of the Old Covenant And that this man to come, this Jesus who is coming, is going to be the Messiah you've all been waiting for. The Old Testament says that Elijah will call out the Messiah and prepare the way for him. John is being that Elijah-like figure. Father sent Jesus, born witness to him. And he says, if you search the scriptures, because you think that in them you will have eternal life, It is that they bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me so that you may have that life. 
You you look, you search, you're, I think, trying to dot every I and do everything perfectly and get the people to do all these things so they're not sinning and they're following in God's way. But the one thing you had to do was to believe in me and you're not. And he doesn't do it because he wants to have the glory. He knows that they don't have, or sometimes we don't have, the love of God within us. But he has come, and they're not having any of it. He says, if other people come in my name, you'll believe him. You'll believe other people who aren't of God, but say that they're of God. It won't even be Jesus who accuses the people of not believing in Jesus to the Father. And that one person he says is Moses, the guy you set your hope on, the guy who gave you the law. Remember, the Pharisees believed in the law and the prophets. When you hear the word law, think Moses. Moses wrote the law. The Sanhedrin only believed in the law. So both sides believed in Moses. You know who's going to accuse you to my father? Moses is going to. Moses gave you enough to believe in me. If you had actually listened to the words Moses said, you would believe in me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? This is heavy talk. And you could imagine very stern for Jesus to be saying this to the religious leaders in Jerusalem. I mean, this is the, not the temple rabbis, this is the big wigs. And he's saying, you think you're following Moses and the law and all these things, and you're not. Because if you did, you would believe my words. Or the other way, if you don't believe in those writings and the things he said, you can't even believe in my words because you haven't even gotten there at all. Said tough talk. That ends chapter five. What I'm going to meditate on is that concept that the Father and the Son are united in that mission. There's nothing that Jesus is saying that God the Father hasn't said either. I think we're going to see that when we get to the Old Testament, that unification of message between the two of them. Jesus and the Father are synchronized in their work. That's amazing. What I'm going to pray about is that I understand God, the Father, better because now I understand Jesus. He shines a light, not just in the world, but he shines a light on who the Father is. I think it's easy, particularly when I was growing up in the Jewish faith, to think of God the Father as angry, is mad at us, is rumbling the mountains at us, burning in, in anger at times. I wonder, but now after reading this, I think Jesus weeps for us because we're not doing the right thing, because we have chosen not to believe his words. And if he's doing it, I think God the Father is too. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that God gives his gifts, like the man he healed, to people who don't ask for it. Sometimes we get things, mercies from God, we never even asked for. We never thought to ask for. That man at the pool, Bethesda, just asked that Jesus brings him closer to the pool. He got so much more than that. That's what I'm going to share with others, is God is rich in the things he gives to us, whether we ask for them or not. All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I appreciate it. I hope that you have a wonderful week. And please remember to subscribe and tell someone else about this podcast. I hope other people will enjoy going through the Bible in a slow roll so that we can extract everything out of it. 